Good morning and welcome on this fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. We start our worship this morning with the hymn, Here I Am, Lord. I invite those of you that are here to reflect upon the words and those of you that are at home to sing out loud.
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Let us hear the readings for this day. The first reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you, pro- for you a prophet like me from among your people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord, your God at Hoab, on the day of the assembly when you said, I'll hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see the great fire. I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But my prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Here ends the reading. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. And they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Jesus taught them as one having authority. As I thought about these readings and discussed them in Bible study, the conversation kept looping back to this issue of authority. The first reading from the book of Deuteronomy is from a section where the role of the prophet is discussed. God declares in that reading, I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to the people everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. So that has some pretty serious implications for us. God is telling us that we will be held accountable if we do not heed the words that a prophet speaks in God's name. But then God continues regarding those prophets. Any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. That is deathly serious for those who claim to be prophets and who say things that are not of God. 
And there are false prophets who weave their way in and out of Scripture. The prophet Jeremiah spoke against the seductiveness of false prophets in leading people astray. And in the book of Ezekiel, God warned against those who prophesy out of their own imagination, who follow their own spirit while having seen nothing of God, who claim falsehoods and whose divinations are a lie, and then say, says the Lord, when it is not the Lord who sent them. So with this backdrop, we hear today's gospel reading. Jesus had entered a synagogue and had begun teaching. Anyone with sufficient learning could be invited to teach in that day, so that wasn't so uncommon. However, when Jesus began talking, very quickly it became apparent that he wasn't teaching in the way that their scribes did, referencing scripture in light of the words and deeds of Jewish teachers. Rather, Jesus was teaching as one having authority he himself. They were astounded, and frankly, they would have been right to be skeptical. After all, who was this Jesus from Nazareth that they should accept what he was saying as authoritative? We recognize that struggle today. How do we make sense of competing voices? How do we discern fact from fiction, truth from falsehoods? who is honest, and who is saying whatever will get them what they are really after. Are some of those voices struggling with mental health issues? It can be hard to know how to judge that which is presented to us. We know it's important to fact check what we are hearing, to listen to other voices, to use our ability to reason, and to ask God to help us discern God's voice amongst the cacophony of voices we are hearing in the world. But how do we determine God's voice? In our gospel story, the answer came through a most unlikely source. A man in the synagogue cried out, accusing Jesus of trying to destroy them, them being unclean spirits, one of which we as readers are told is within that man. The unclean spirit became made a startling declaration. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. The very spirits amongst humanity that possess and destroy us are the ones who recognize Jesus. And in this synagogue, witness to who Jesus was. Jesus declared silence and ordered the unclean spirit to leave the man. With convulsions and a loud voice, the man was set free of the unclean spirit, no match for the Holy One of God. The astonishment within the synagogue escalated. What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Well, you can imagine how quickly that flew through the community. Crowds began following Jesus wherever he went. Healings were a big part of Jesus' ministry, setting people free of ailments that beset them and making people whole, not just physically, but spiritually. And that's where the rub began forgiving sins, interpreting the law not in a rigid way, but in a compassionate way that served the well-being of the people, letting the disciples glean for food on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, feasting instead of fasting, eating with the unclean, the sinners and tax collectors, and teachings that challenge power and privilege. Deny yourself and take up your cross. To be great, you must be a servant of all. The first will be last, and the last will be first. Give abundantly, and if rich, sell what you have and give to the poor. Jesus' authority began to be questioned, and soon there was outright hostility toward Jesus from religious leaders. At the same time, we hear warnings about false prophets again, warnings against false prophets who wear sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. False prophets who rise up when we betray and hate one another and lead many astray. False prophets who produce great signs and omens attempting to wow and mislead. Those warnings continued in the early church. Second Peter warns, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive opinions. And in the first letter of John, we read, Beloved, 
Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we are faced with several realizations. Jesus' authority comes from being the Holy One of God. It is authority that may challenge us and be something we don't want to hear, such as happened with the religious authorities, or recall the story of Jonah last week. And there are false prophets who will seek to lead us astray, especially likely if they are saying something we want to hear and there is division amongst us. So how do we discern what God is revealing to us through Jesus rather than being misled by false prophets? We start with the Gospels, of course, where we find the teachings of Jesus. But there are four Gospels, not one, and they aren't the same. That is significant. Each was written to a different community of people with different emphases based upon different circumstances and time. There isn't a right one or a wrong one a judgment we too quickly make in our highly polarized world today. But rather, four writers addressing four communities that have different realities and therefore the need to emphasize different things in order to speak effectively. Mark, the shortest gospel and written closest to the time of Jesus' resurrection, still has a sense of being stunned by this most amazing good news. Matthew, written to a Jewish Christian community, has a significant emphasis on Jesus' interpretation of the law and Old Testament prophecies coming true. Luke, writing to a Gentile Christian community and likely a physician, emphasizes Jesus' care for the poor and forgotten within society. By the time of John's Gospel, deepening division and hardening of lines have developed within the Jewish community over Jesus as the Messiah. Different communities, different realities, call for shaping the good news in different ways. So we need to hear those nuances in all four, but the essentials are the same, and that is what we seek as the authority for our lives. Death and resurrection, mercy and forgiveness that transforms sin into new life, healing of body, mind, and soul, as we heard in today's gospel, compassion and mercy, inclusion of Jew and Gentile, of the connected and marginalized, discipleship that is marked by servanthood, Jesus distilling the law down to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. These are the kind of foundational truths within the four Gospels that are authoritative for us as Christians. They are our measuring stick by which we test the cacophony of voices that assail us in this world. And let us remember, Scripture, the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is going to challenge us. Love God, love neighbor, it is going to challenge us. Love our enemies, it is going to challenge us. Deny oneself and take up one's cross, it is going to challenge us. The first must be last and servant of all, it is going to challenge us. If it's not challenging us, if it is only making us feel comfortable, then we need to question if we are listening to false prophets rather than to Jesus. I listened to an interview this week with John Lewis. John Lewis, of course, was the congressman from Georgia who died last year, who at the age of 25 was beaten unconscious on the the Edmund Pettus Bridge during a march of the civil rights movement in 1965. In the interview, recorded seven years ago, he spoke of his Christian faith and his commitment to love in action. While he was a teen, he asked his parents why he, as a black youth, couldn't receive the same education as white youth. And his parents told him, it's just the way it is. Don't make no trouble. But he read the Bible, and he listened in church, and he began to believe that somehow, some way, things were going to get better because of what Jesus had already done. It's just that it's up to us to make it real in this world. That began a lifetime of being committed to love in action, believing that whatever he did, whether a sit-in, a freedom ride, a march from Selma to Montgomery, whatever, that it had to be done with love, kindness, peace, nonviolence. Hate, he said, is too heavy a burden to bear. 
He called his Christian faith the bedrock of his life, and it challenged him through the decades of his life to deepen his understanding of love and to put that love into action in ways that certainly weren't comfortable, but that gave him peace, knowing he was listening to the ultimate authority in his life. And that's true for us, too. We will follow him perfectly because we're human, but our intent can be earnest fact-checking, listening to other voices, using our ability to reason, asking God for discernment, and hearing God's voice amongst the cacophony of voices we hear in the world. Resisting being pulled to and fro by the false prophets in our world, of which there are certainly as many today as there were in the days of the Bible, is by studying and following the way of love of the one who taught with authority, Jesus, the Holy One of God we can expect to be challenged. It won't always be comfortable, but it will always bring us peace. Amen.
invite you to stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our prayers this morning are from the Book of Common Prayer, Form 2. During the silence after each bidding, you are invited to offer your own silent prayers. Let us pray. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil. And in the Dawson cycle of prayer, we pray for the Diocesan Support Center staff. Danny Casey, Ray Costa, and spouse, the Venerable Steve Costa, Denise Esposito, and spouse Michael, the Reverend Canon Sandy Graham and the Reverend Heather Patton Graham, Sonny Liu, the Reverend Jara Pasalo and spouse the Reverend Annalise Pasalo, Peter Pereira and spouse Serene. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of God. Pray that they may find and be found by the one who is the source of our being. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died and all who are grieving. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And at our bishop's request, we add two additional prayers from the Book of Common Prayer. Grant, O God, that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart, and especially the hearts of the people of the United States, that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatred cease. That our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O oh God, you've bound us together in a common life. Help us in the midst of our struggles for justice and truth to confront one another without hatred or bitterness and to work together with mutual forbearance and respect. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated for the announcements and for birthdays. First, you see all these flowers. Uh, that's the Tokaikolo congregation. They're having a wedding uh, later today. Um, there is the annual meeting today, 845. So those of you that are here can just stay in your spots. Uh, if you are attending the meeting in person, it's also possible to attend the meeting by Zoom. Uh, it will, the Zoom room will open up when we finish the service, but it will be, uh, the meeting will officially start at 845. Um, it's a chance to hear the, a little bit about the ministry of 2020, looking ahead to 2021, um, and um, we need you because we need a quorum. So please join us for our first ever Zoom in-person annual meeting. Um, thank you to the Altar Guild. We had a great response in washing robes. I think uh, in the process, mine went out the door, so if someone is washing it, thank you very much. Um, I'm sporting one of the newly uh, laundered acolyte robes. Uh, so people have been really, this is beautiful, it's like shiny white. People have really been working uh, on these robes. Thank you very much. The Altar Guild thanks you. Uh, we have a, this week Zoom Bible study at 10. Jazz Vespers posted by six, uh, Wednesday Bible study. Jazz Vespers posted by six on Thursday. A uh, moment with music with Dr. Epping every uh, weekday morning, posted by 6 a.m., but you can watch it any time throughout the day. We have a, a great news this morning. Uh, Tom and Sarah Fargo had their first grandbaby, born this week, Tuesday, in Hong Kong. The baby is William Cannon Fargo, Jr. They're calling him Liam. And thanks to the wonders of technology, although they can't be there, they have a, one of those big screen TVs, and they're able to see them. It must be like having them in their living room. So let us pray in thanksgiving for the birth of this new baby. O oh God, we give thanks for the blessing you've bestowed upon this family in giving them a child. Confirm their joy by a lively sense of your presence with them and give them calm strength and patient wisdom as they seek to bring Liam to love all that is true and noble, just and pure, lovable and gracious, excellent and admirable, following the example of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And according to our church records that we know of, we have one birthday this week, and that's Kathleen Chang. Her birthday's tomorrow. So let us pray for Kathleen. O oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray, on your servant Kathleen as she begins another year. Grant that she may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen her trust in your goodness all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Normally we would have offering at this time. We aren't passing offering bowls during this time of COVID, but they are at the doors and at home. You are able to... Um, provide your offering through the uh, mail, the snail mail, or uh, through online at the website. Thank you very much for your continuing support of the ministry of this church. And now enjoy a musical interlude as I go to wash my hands for Eucharist. <laughs>
I invite you to stand. Let us lift our hearts to the Lord and give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the word made flesh, you've caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in Jesus Christ the Word made flesh. For in these last days you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you've delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ you've brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he'd given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O God, we remember Christ's death, we proclaim Christ's resurrection, we await Christ's coming and glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray, you gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom we are acceptable to you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. We pray as Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you to be seated. I will come to you and drop a wafer in your palm. I ask you to hold on to it until I return, and then we will all partake together.
the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of Christ and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Savior, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.